All right, so open your notebooks to um, where you left off at yesterday because we're going to take a few more notes over the sound waves and then we'll start talking about the electric magnetic, electric magnetic waves, radiation, effect on all kinds of stuff. Billions, even thousands of cues about what's going on in your environment every day, strictly from sound. In addition to things like speech and music, there are other bits of auditory information that shape your day. An ambulance passing by, a baby crying in the next room, and of course, sorry, just got a text. But there's a lot we can learn, not just from what these cues mean, but from how sound itself works. Studying sound waves has helped doctors learn more about our ears and has allowed engineers to design things like microphones and speakers. Biologists have even used the science of sound to figure out how animals like elephants can communicate over long distances, when we can't even hear them doing it. It all comes down to the fact that sound is a wave, which travels through a medium like air or water. And knowing that sound is a wave is important, because it means that we can use the physics of waves to describe the qualities of sound. you probably think of the kind you see at the ocean, or the ones you made when you jumped on that trampoline last time. Those waves produce ripples that run... Okay, so those type of waves are called traveling waves. So you don't have to write that down, but you are going to need to know what the sound waves are that called. trampoline last time. Those waves produce ripples that run perpendicular to the direction that the wave is traveling in. The sound is the other kind of wave. It's a longitudinal wave. Longitudinal waves is what sound waves are considered so they oscillate they're like an os they oscillate which means we all know what that means yes to oscillate meaning that the waves back and forth motion happen the waves move back and forth motion and that happens in the same direction in which the wave is traveling the longitudinal waves are waves that move back, have a back and forth motion, and um, they move in the same direction. That back and forth motion moves in the same direction in which the waves are traveling. There's more like a spring, because remember, you had compression, we had like higher compressions, and then it had the lower compression, compressions, and then you had the High peaks were called compression, and the low peaks were called um, refraction. Has everybody got this part down? Things in the same direction in which the wave travels. Say you get a text message on your phone and it makes a nice bright little ding sound. What will it actually happen? Like on a physical level. Your phone speaker contains a diagram, a piece of stiff material, usually in the shape of a cone. When you got the message, the electronics inside the speaker made the diaphragm move back and forth, which vibrated the air around your phone. That made the atoms and molecules in the air move back and forth. Then, those moving particles vibrated the air around them, and as the process continued, the sound wave spread outward. Sorry, I'll turn this off now. Anyway. Physicists sometimes describe sound waves in terms of the movement of these particles in the air, in what's known as a displacement wave. But by moving particles in the air, sound waves also do something else. They cause the air to compress and expand, which is why sound waves are sometimes described as pressure waves. As the wave spreads through the air, the particles end up bunching together in some places and spreading out in others. Together, all that bunching and spreading out causes areas of high pressure and low pressure to form and move through the air. It's useful to describe sound waves as pressure waves because we can build devices that detect those changes in pressure. That's how some microphones work, for example. They use a diaphragm stretched over a sealed compartment, and as sound waves pass by, they create areas of lower or higher pressure in the compartment. The differences in pressure cause the diaphragm to move back and forth, 
which electronics then translate into audio data. And your eardrums basically work in the same way. As pressure waves pass through, they make your eardrum vibrate. Your brain then interprets those vibrations as sound. But not all sounds are the same. Even before we knew much about physics, humans were describing sound in terms of certain qualities, mainly by things like loudness and pip. Our understanding of those qualities helped shape the development of music, which we'll talk about more next time. But there's also a more physics-y side to those qualities of music. Pitch can be high or low, and it corresponds to the frequency of the wave. All right, so the pitch of a wave can be high or low, and it, whether it's high or low depends on the frequency of the wave. So the frequency of the wave predicts the pitch, okay? So uh, the higher the compression is, the higher the pitch is. The lower the compression is, the lower the pitch is. So if the waves are moving really fast, real frequently, then um, more frequently, that it'll oscillate such long periods of time, then it's gonna be a real high pitch. And if they're moving real slow, which we find out when we start talking about the electric spectrum, that radio waves are our slowest moving waves on our spectrum. Pitch can be high or low, and it corresponds to the frequency of the wave, and the frequency of the wave determines the pitch. So air that's vibrating back and forth more times per second will have a higher pitch, and air that's vibrating fewer times per second will have a lower pitch. All right, so if it's moving more, more times per second, it's going to have the higher pitch. So the faster it moves, the higher the pitch will be. The slower it moves, the lower the pitch will be. And frequency has to do with the speed at which it's moving. The air that's vibrating fewer times per second will have a lower pitch. Humans hear sounds best when vibrations are somewhere between 20 per second on the low end. All right, so humans hear best. So if you look up here, they have this chart, and it has the infrasounds and then the ultrasound, or uh, ultrasounds, and it has our frequencies, which is measured in hertz, and then it tells us that this is zero to 20, so this would be 20 hertz to, two, to 20,000 hertz. So in between these is where humans hear the best. Okay, you need to know that and put that in your notes. In between, between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. The older you get the the harder it is for you to hear. You don't hear as well. But if you'll also notice while you're doing that, elephants, their frequency is between, I don't know, two and a half um, to, to about 25, 26, 27, somewhere around in there. So elephants can't hear any of the, any pictures higher than this or it's very rare for them to be able to. And then if you look at the cats and the dogs, the dogs and the cats, they can hear all the way up to the 40,000. And then look at your bats and dolphins. They, hear, they can hear almost all the way up to the 160,000 hertz. Has everybody got down at the human? The other one you have to know is the one for the human. Between 20 per second on the low end, and 20,000 per second on the high end. As we get older and lose more of the stars that help us to detect sound, we start to lose the ability to hear the higher pitch sounds. Some building security companies will take advantage of this using devices that emit a high pitch noise that most people over the age of 25 can't hear. The idea is that since kids and teens can hear it, and it's super annoying to them, they won't hang out near the building. But some sounds are too high or low for any humans to hear. Sounds that are too high in pitch are called ultrasonic. All right, ultrasonic sounds are sounds that we can't hear, that humans can't hear. It doesn't say everything on Earth, it's humans can't hear. Um, and that's in the, ultra, the ultrasonic, ultrasonic is the high, is is really high high pitch so that's the pitch when it's way too high and then um then uh you have the ones that are too low 
and the sounds that are too low are called infrasonic. They're called infrasonic. So you have the ultrasonic, which is really high, high pitch, which means they have a, a major, like a really, really high frequency or fast frequency. And then you have the infrasonic, which is really, really low and has a real slow frequency. So the dolphins and the bats would be under which one of those? Ultrasonic. Somebody raise their hand. Yes. Ultrasonic. Yes. And so what would be in the infrasonic from our chart? Someone who hasn't answered a question. The elephant. The elephant, yes. Dog whistles, for example, will use an ultrasonic pitch that's too high for us but it's perfectly audible to dogs. Elephants, on the other hand, use infrasonic sound to communicate with each other. Anybody in here have a dog whistle? Usually the people that have it are the people that use them for hunting, like birds or coyotes, mountain lions. And they blow it when they want them to come back and we can't hear it, but they can. That is considered an ultrasonic sound also. Across long distances, they can hear these calls from several kilometers away, but we can't hear them at all. Another aspect of shape sound is its loudness. When you increase the intensity of the sound, you increase its loudness. All right, so when you increase the intensity of the sound, that makes it louder. When you increase the intensity of a sound, then the sound becomes louder. you increase its loudness and vice versa. We've talked about the intensity of a wave before. It's the wave's power over its area measured in... Okay, so the way they figure the intensity is intensity equals power over area. So that would be power divided by area. And that uh, is measured in the watts per second with a, in a square meter. So like in this classroom, if we were playing music and it seemed really, really loud in here, but we take that same music and we go to the gym and we play it at the same place in the volume, play on eight or nine, is it gonna seem loud in there, in the gym? No, because it has such a bigger area that it's gonna go out to, so therefore the intense is not as high or extreme, okay? So intensity is power um, divided by or over area, which means to divide, right? Watts per meter squared. We've also said that the intensity of a wave is proportional to the wave's amplitude here. squared. And the further you are from the source of a wave, the lower its intensity by the square of the distance between you and the source. And just as there's a range of pitches that humans can hear, there's also a range of sound wave intensity that humans can hear comfortably. Generally, people can safely hear sounds from about one picowatt per square meter up to one watt per square meter, which is about as loud as a rock concert if you're near the speakers. The sound waves coming from a jet plane that's 30 meters away, for example, probably has an intensity of around 100 watts per meter squared. Now, I don't know if you've ever been that close to a roaring jet plane, but there is a reason why the people that work on the tarmac at airports use those heavy duty headphones. Below one picowatt per square meter, sounds are just too soft for us to detect them. And although we will hear sounds above a watt per square meter, they tend to hurt our ears. So here's a weird thing about loudness and intensity. It's not a linear relationship. Generally, a sound wave needs to have 10 times the intensity to sound twice as loud to us. This relationship holds true as long as the sound is towards the middle of the range of the frequencies we can hear. So instead of directly measuring the loudness of sounds by their intensity, we use units called decibels, which are based on bells. Bells convert a sound wave's intensity to a logarithmic scale, where every notch on the scale is 10 times higher than the previous one. The scale starts off with an intensity of one picowatt per square meter, corresponding to zero bells. So a sound that's one bell is 10 times as intense as a sound that's zero bells. And a sound that's two bells is 10 times as intense as a sound that's one bell, but 100 times as intense as a sound that's zero bells. Measuring everything in bells can be kind of annoying because sometimes you want to talk about sounds that are, say, 3.4 bells without having to deal with decimal points. That's why most of the time you'll hear the loudness of a sound described using the more familiar decibel unit. 
a tenth of a bar. To find the loudness of the sound when you know its intensity, you take the base 10 logarithm of its intensity over the reference intensity of one picowatt per square meter. Then you multiply that number by 10 to get the sound's decibel level. We can use this equation to convert the intensity of that noisy rock concert, which we said was one watt per square meter, to decibels. First, we take the base 10 log of one watt per square meter over one picowatt per square meter. Now, one divided by one times 10 to the minus 12 is just one times 10 to the 12. So what we really want to do is take the base 10 log of one times 10 to the 12 or a trillion watts per meter squared. What a logarithm asks you to do is find the power that you would need to raise the base to in order to get the number in parentheses. In other words, we're looking for the exponent of 10 that would equal 1 times 10 to the 12, which is just 12. To finish off the calculation of decibels from intensity, we multiply that value, 12, by 10 to get the decibel level of the rock concert where you were standing. 120 decibels. Ow! You'll notice that as the source of the sound moves closer to you, it gets louder, and as it moves away, it gets softer. All right, so the closer the sound gets to you, the louder it is, and the further away it gets from you, the softer it is. Or the closer you get to the source of the sound, it gets louder. Or the further you may move away from it, it gets softer. That makes sense, since the closer you are to the source of the sound, the greater the intensity of the wave that hits your ear. But have you ever noticed that the pitch of the sound changes too? It's called the Doppler effect. As the source of sound moves towards you, the pitch... Alright, the Doppler effect is, as the source of sound moves towards you, the pitch... Let me get that down, I'm going on. The Doppler effect is called, is, um... As the source of the sound moves towards you, the pitch gets, what do y'all think? Think it's higher or lower? Before I flip it over, what do you think? Anybody have an idea? Anybody have a thought? As the sound moves towards you, the pitch becomes what? Higher or lower? The sound you hear increases. And it's going to increase. The pitch of the sound will increase. Increase means what? It's going to get what? Higher or lower? Higher. Higher. So the closer the sound gets to you, the higher or the pitch will increase. The higher the pitch becomes or the louder it becomes. Did I get ahead of y'all? Here, Lila. Is this where you were? The doctor effect is the source of sound moves towards you, the pitch will increase. The pitch of the sound will increase. So the closer it gets to you, the pitch will get higher. If it's increasing, it's going to get higher. If it's decreasing, it's going to get lower. Towards you, the pitch of the sound you hear increases, and as the source moves away, the pitch decreases. To see why, imagine you're standing on the sidewalk when suddenly you hear an ambulance siren start up. It's coming from down the road and it seems to be moving towards you. The ambulance is continuously emitting sound waves at a certain frequency in the form of that siren. But as the ambulance moves towards you, the ambulance is also moving towards those sound waves. So the peaks that hit your eardrums are closer together, even though... So, um, and we've all done this. We've all heard a siren and we stop. And usually if you hear a siren, it's usually the ambulance or um, the fire department, right? And we stop, especially if you're driving, you're gonna slow down and you're gonna listen to see if that sound is getting louder or not. Because if it's getting louder, then you know you're probably gonna have to pull over to the side of the road because the ambulance could be coming your way. And you, when, you, when the ambulance is coming your way, you pull to the right, leave the left open. Have y'all ever done that? Like listen to see if it's coming too closer to you or not. 
who they're moving at a certain speed, and you get hit by them more often, which means that you hear a higher pitched sound. At the same time, it keeps emitting more sound, which adds more peaks to those earlier sound waves that were heading your way. What you end up with is a sound wave with a higher frequency than before. That's what hits your eardrum, so you hear a sound that's higher in pitch than the one you heard when the ambulance was further away from you. As the ambulance passes you and starts to drive away down the road, the opposite happens. Sound waves still coming toward you, but the ambulance is driving away from them. So the peaks that hit your eardrum are farther apart and you hear a sound with a lower pitch. The Doppler effect isn't only unique to sound waves, it happens with light too, which means we can actually use it to measure the distance of stars. But more on that much later. For now you learned about sound waves and how they move particles back and forth to create differences in pressure. We also talked about pitch and how the intensity of a sound wave changes with amplitude and distance. Finally, we covered decibels as well as the Doppler effect. Crash Course Physics is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. You can head over to their channel and check out a playlist of the latest episodes from shows like Gross Science. Something surrounds you, bombards you, some of which you can't see, touch, or even feel. Every day, everywhere you go, it is odorless and tasteless, yet you use it and depend on it every hour of every day. Without it, the world you know could not exist. What is it? Electromagnetic radiation. Alright, electromagnetic radiation is all around us. Um, day and night, and without it, the world that you know would not exist if we didn't have electromagnetic radiation waves. And we'll be learning about there's different speeds that the, way, that, the, that the waves travel depending on where you're at on the spectrum, and we go all the way from radio waves, which is a little bit different than sound waves, okay? I know a lot of people think sound waves and radio waves are the sound because the same because when you hear a radio, you hear the word radio, you think of music, when you think of music, you think of sound, right? But they're, they're, they're all different types of, um, the big thing is how they travel. Um, but if it wasn't for these electromagnetic uh, radiation waves, that's what we know now, you wouldn't have. These waves spread across a spectrum from very short gamma rays to X-rays, ultraviolet rays, visible light waves, even longer infrared waves, microwaves, to radio waves which can measure longer than a mountain range. This spectrum is the foundation of the information age and of our modern world. Your radio, remote control, text message, television, microwave oven, even a doctor's X-ray all depend on waves within the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic waves, or EM waves, are similar to ocean waves. In All right, so you can either call them electric mag magnetic waves or EM waves, but they're similar to the ocean waves. And how they're similar is they both are what they the call both. energy waves. So the electromagnetic waves are similar to ocean waves and those similarities are they both are considered an energy wave they both are considered an energy wave are energy waves they transmit energy which means they transmit energy they're an energy wave they're transmitting some type of energy EM waves are produced by the vibration of charged particles and have electric. All right, so the way that the electromagnetic waves are produced is they're produced by the vibration of charged particles. 
that's the first way, or first part, is they are produced by the vibration of charged particles and they have electrical and, you know, when you get there, EM waves or electric magnetical waves are produced by the vibration of charged particles and have electrical and and magnetic properties. Magnetic properties, which is where they get electromagnetic. Think of electricity and think of a magnet. And that will help you remember that word. Electromagnetic. But the difference, the, the difference between them and the water waves is that the water waves, you have the ocean waves have to have water. But unlike ocean waves that require water, EM waves travel through the vacuum of space at the comp. And EM waves travel through the vacuum of space. Now, not all your waves on your electric magnetic spectrum travels through vacuums, but the, the higher intense ones and the ones that have the most frequency, they do. constant speed of light. And they're moving at the constant speed of light. So, EM waves travel through vacuums of space at the constant speed of light. They travel through the vacuum of space at the constant speed of at light. At the constant speed of light. EM waves have crests and troughs like ocean waves. All right, so you can do this one or two ways. You can either go back to the diagram that we drew the other day that we're going to add to it, or you can draw you a new one, okay? It's up to you. So on the sound waves, we call the peaks, what do we call them? Compressions, right? Mm -hmm. And then we call the lower ones uh, refraction, yes? But on, they're also, the peaks are also considered the crust, I mean the crest, when we're not talking about sound waves, okay? When we're talking about the electric magnetic waves, they call it the crest. So the high peak ones are considered the crest, and the low ones are considered the trough. So you could have, so this peak could be, could be called, be called the crest, or it can be called compression. Depends on if we're talking about sound waves or if we're talking about electric dynamic waves. And then you have the trough, which is the same way. It can be um, either considered a trough or it can be considered a, refra a refraction, or a fraction. And when I think of the trough, it kind of looks like a trough that you feed cows in. You know, they're kind of round at some of them are. Everybody's got that down. We're fixing to get another one. Everybody's got down about the crests and the waves and the throbs of the waves. Between crests is the wavelength. Okay, so the wavelength is the distance between one crest to the other. So from this crest to this crest would be the wavelength. And then from this crest to that crest would be a wavelength. But in water, in the sound crest, the sound waves travel differently than the ultraviolet. So most of your ultraviolet ones, the wavelength is going to be the same all the way across, unless something happens that increases the intensity or it lowers the intensity. But the wavelength runs from, is the length from one crest to the next. Now, it's not from the beginning of the wave to where you see it ending. It's just from the crest to crest. While some EM wavelengths are very long and are measured in meters, many are tiny and are measured in billions of a meter, nanometers. The number of these... So what wave, wave, wave do you think is measured in nanometers? Radio waves or gamma rays? Gamma waves 
on my right. nose and that can at a given point within one second is described as the frequency of the wave. Okay, the frequency of the wave is. Is the number of crest that pass the number of crest, which is the top peaks, that pass the number of these crests that pass a given point with a given point within one second. So radio waves is going to take them because they're a much longer wave. It's going to take them a longer time to get to that to that second. To that to that point that they're measuring it on, right? So they're not going to have as many as many waves or crests as the gamma rays, because and then the gamma rays could pass it like a whole bunch of times, and they're measured, which is why they're called nanometers. Within one second is described as the frequency of the wave. One wave or cycle per second is called a hertz. One wave or cycle per second is called a hearse. So however many waves past that point that you're uh, measuring from, so it can be like, if, it, if three crests pass it, then it's three hertz. If 10 waves, 10 um, crests pass it, then it's 10 hertz. Does that make sense? Long EM waves, such as radio waves, have the lowest frequency and carry less energy. Adding energy increases the frequency of the wave and makes the wavelength shorter. All right, so when you add energy, the frequency increases, which also increases your energy, which makes your wavelength shorter. I will repeat that. When you add energy to the frequency of a wave, then the wave um, increases in speed. Which means they also increase in frequency, yes? And they also carry more energy. So the higher the energy is, the higher amount of frequency you're going to have, okay? Or vice versa. The higher frequency, the higher amount of energy is going through that wave at the time. Now, if you notice on here, there is uh, this. They have a. They have the spectrum here, and it starts with radio waves, and then we go to microwaves, infrared, visual ultraviolet, x-ray, and then your gamma rays. And we will be modeling this in our book, but we model it this way instead of this way because I think it's easier for you to remember. And you will, we will learn and take notes on what each of those type of rays do and what they're used for and everything. But like I said, radio waves are not the same as sound waves, okay? Um, that's all we're gonna do today because that's as far as the first hour class got. And we'll pick this back up tomorrow. Friday, your lab will be over sound. And um, it'll be in stations. So you'll move from one station to the next. I'll put you in groups. Depending on how many stations I set up, how many people will be in each group. Any questions? You may put your books up. Put them up quietly, please. Yes. Split the left and the uh, be in the lab room. We're supposed to be in the STEM lab last week, but we were at the softball, but we did the softball stuff. So we did. We'll be in the science lab. We won't be in the STEM lab until next. Next Friday, I won't be here, so we will do our lab on Thursday. And we should be in the STEM lab, but we'll probably do it in here or depending on what's going on, what lab we're doing, we might do it in the big lab. And what lab we're doing will depend on how far we get to pen notes. 
So in two weeks, we'll be, we're out for uh, fall break. Fall break is like the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th. So you're out on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We're always out on Saturday, Sunday. And then on a Monday. Okay. So that Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, before that will be finals. 